The Governance of China, Volume 2, by Xi Jinping. Audiobook, Part 25. Increase Sino-Arab Dialogue and Expand Common Ground. January 21st, 2016. Part of the speech at the Arab League headquarters. China follows a path of peaceful development, an independent foreign policy of peace, and a mutually beneficial strategy of opening up. It is our priority to take an active part in global governance, pursue mutually beneficial cooperation, assume international responsibilities and obligations, expand convergence of interests with other countries, and forge a community of shared future for mankind. We will make good use of the coming five years, a crucial period for us, to build the Belt and Road and establish the guiding principles of peace, innovation, guidance, governance, and integration. We would like to be the builders of peace, promoters of development, boosters of industrialization, supporters of stability, and partners of people-to-people -people exchanges in the Middle East. China is ready to work with Arab states to build the Belt and Road and expand common ground in our respective efforts to achieve national rejuvenation. First, we should stand for peace and dialogue and take steps to promote stability. The Belt and Road Initiative calls for exchanges between nations and civilizations for better mutual understanding rather than mutual resentment. It is important to remove, rather than erect, walls between nations, take dialogue as the golden rule, and be good neighbors. The ancient Chinese philosopher Mencius said, Ensuring the right conduct and upholding justice should be the paths to follow across the land. Footnote 1. The Mencius. Mengzi. End of footnote 1. With regard to China's policy measures towards the Middle East, China decides its position on the basis of the merits of each case and the fundamental interests of the people in the Middle East. Rather than looking for a proxy in the Middle East, we promote peace talks. Rather than seeking any sphere of influence, we call on all parties to join the Circle of Friends for the Belt and Road Initiative. Rather than attempting to fill any power vacuum, we build a cooperative partnership network for win-win outcomes. The Chinese people believe in the philosophy of change and adaptation. The Arabs also say, continuing in the same state is impossible. We respect the Arab state's aspiration for reform and support Arab states in their efforts to independently explore the path of development. It is of vital importance to properly balance reform, development, and stability. This is like camel racing, a popular sport in the Arab world. If the camel runs too fast at the beginning, it may be exhausted towards the end of the race. Yet, if it starts too slow, it may lag behind in the end. Only the rider who keeps a good balance between speed and stamina can claim the final victory. The spread of terrorist and extremist ideas poses a serious challenge to peace and development. Countries need to reach a consensus on the fight against terrorist and extremist forces. Terrorism knows no borders. There is no such thing as good terrorism, and there should be no double standards in fighting terrorism for the same reason. Terrorism should not be linked with any specific ethnic group or religion, as it will only create ethnic and religious tensions. No policy can be effective on its own, and a comprehensive strategy that addresses both symptoms and root causes must be applied in the fight against terrorism. To this end, China will set up a China-Arab Research Center on Reform and Development, 
we will hold a roundtable conference on inter-civilization dialogue and eradication of extremism within the framework of the China Arab States Cooperation Forum and organize exchange visits by 100 eminent religious leaders. We will enhance cooperation on cybersecurity, block the online transmission of audio and video materials instigating violence and terrorism, and jointly participate in the formation of an international counterterrorism convention in cyberspace. We will provide U.S. $300 million of assistance to support such projects as law enforcement cooperation and police training to help relevant countries enhance their capacity in maintaining law and order. Second, we need to advance structural adjustment and adopt new ways of cooperation. Given the ever fiercer global competition in development, we need to upgrade our cooperation. We need to advance the oil and gas plus cooperation model and tap further potential. China is ready to strengthen cooperation with Arab states across the entire industrial chain from upstream to midstream to downstream renew long-term oil purchase agreements, and enter into strategic energy cooperation with Arab states that features mutual benefit, reliability, and enduring friendship. It is important to set up a new mechanism for trade and investment and expand space for cooperation. As China is already on the fast track of outbound investment and Arab states boast strong, sovereign wealth funds, we can sign more currency swap and mutual investment agreements, expand renminbi settlement business, accelerate investment facilitation, and steer the investment funds and private capital of our two sides towards major projects under the Belt and Road Initiative. It is important to step up high-tech cooperation and foster new driving forces for our cooperation. On the basis of existing technology transfer and training centers, the two sides can speed up the introduction of new and high technologies such as high-speed rail, nuclear power, aerospace, new energy, and genetic engineering so as to add more value to the pragmatic cooperation between China and Arab states. For this purpose, China will implement an action plan for new forms of cooperation, explore a model of package cooperation involving oil, loans, and projects, extend the traditional oil and gas cooperation chain, and cooperate in the development of new and renewable energy. China will take part in the development of industrial parks in the Middle East with priority given to the Suez Economic and Trade Cooperation Zone by means of personnel training and joint planning and building of factories. We will integrate the whole process from processing and manufacturing to transportation and export. We will launch a China-Arab Scientific and Technological Partnership Program and jointly build 10 lab laboratories in such areas as modern agriculture, information and communications technology, ICT, and health. We will hold a China-Arab States Baidu Cooperation Forum. Third, we need to advance industrialization in the Middle East and carry out industrial complementarity cooperation. Such cooperation is consistent with the overall trend of economic diversification in the Middle East. It can help Middle East countries embark on a new path of efficient, people-oriented, and green industrialization. Chinese equipment is of high quality and yet low in cost. Combined with technology transfer, personnel training, and strong financing support, we can help countries in the Middle East develop urgently needed industries with relatively low costs, such as iron and steel, non-ferrous metals, construction materials, glass, car manufacturing, and power plants. These will fill the gaps in their industrial structure and foster new comparative strengths. 
China's competitive manufacturing capacity and the rich human resources in the Middle East, when combined, will deliver more and better job opportunities for the region. This morning, I attended the inauguration ceremony of the second phase of the China-Egypt-Suez Economic and Trade Cooperation Zone. The project will bring to Egypt over 100 companies in such sectors as textiles, garments, oil equipment, motorcycles, and solar energy, and create over 10,000 jobs for Egypt. In order to promote the industrialization in the Middle East, China will work with Arab states to launch an action plan for industrial cooperation. Under this initiative, China will set up a U.S. $15 billion special loan for industrialization in the Middle East to be used on industrial cooperation and infrastructure projects in regional countries and provide countries in the Middle East with U.S. $10 billion of commercial loans to support industrial cooperation. China will also provide U.S. $10 billion of concessional loans with even more favorable terms for regional countries. Meanwhile, China will launch a U.S. $20 billion joint investment fund with the UAE and Qatar to invest primarily in traditional energy, infrastructure, development, and high-end manufacturing industries in the Middle East. Fourth, we need to strengthen cultural exchanges and mutual learning and take actions to enhance friendship. Like the diverse species in Mother Nature, cultural diversity gives life to our planet. The Middle East is the meeting place of ancient human civilizations and home to diverse and splendid civilizations and cultures. China will never waver in its support for Middle East and Arab states in preserving their ethnic and cultural traditions and will oppose all forms of discrimination and prejudice against specific ethnic groups or religions. The Chinese and Arab civilizations each have their own systems and distinctive features, yet they both embody the common ideals and aspirations of mankind for development and progress, and they both champion such values as moderation, peace, forgiveness, tolerance, and self-restraint. We should promote dialogue among civilizations in a spirit of inclusiveness and mutual learning, and explore together values in our respective cultural traditions that remain relevant today as positive guidance for good relations. The regions covered by the Belt and Road Initiative are vibrant in people-to-people -people exchanges. The close ties between our peoples must be nurtured through continued efforts. Yesterday, I met with 10 long-standing Arab friends who have received the Award for Outstanding Contribution to China-Arab Friendship. It is the hard work of generations of friendly people from both sides that has enabled the seedlings of China-Arab Friendship to grow into luxuriant and evergreen trees. In order to ensure a smooth flow of talent and ideas along the Belt and Road, we will implement the 100 thousand and ten thousand project for enhancing china arab friendship under the project we will launch a silk road book translation program for the translation of 100 chinese and arab classics into each other's languages we will increase exchanges between our think tanks and invite 100 experts and scholars to visit each other's countries we will provide 1,000 training opportunities for young Arab leaders and invite 1,500 leaders of Arab political parties to visit China to nurture young envoys and political leaders of China-Arab friendship. In addition, we will provide 10,000 scholarships and 10,000 training opportunities for Arab states and organize mutual visits for 10,000 Chinese and Arab artists. 
A Brighter Future for China-Russia Relations June 25, 2016 Speech at the meeting marking the 15th anniversary of the Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation. Distinguished President Vladimir Putin, Ladies and Gentlemen, Dear Friends, We gather here today to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation. First of all, on behalf of the Chinese government and people, and in my own name, I would like to extend warm greetings to people from various sectors of China and Russia who have been working to promote friendship between the two countries. Fifteen years ago, on the basis of our experience and achievements in developing bilateral relations, China and Russia signed the Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation. The treaty established a new model of bilateral relations featuring non-alignment, non-confrontation, not targeting any third party, and everlasting friendship. This new model of bilateral relations has been solidified in a legal instrument, laying a solid legal foundation for the long-term development of China-Russia relations in the 21st century. Guided by the purposes and principles of the treaty, both sides soon solved the remaining border issues carried over from history and have established a comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination featuring equality, mutual trust, mutual assistance, common prosperity, and everlasting friendship. This has brought tangible benefit to both peoples and made a positive contribution to peace, security, and stability in the region and the world. Over the past 15 years, Guided by the spirit of the treaty, the China-Russia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership of Coordination has rapidly moved forward to a high level, with fruitful results in cooperation in many fields. Our two countries have prioritized each other in our respective diplomatic agendas. We have lived in harmony, treated each other as equals, firmly supported each other on issues concerning our core interests, and respected each other's choice of the path of development that suits our national conditions, and enjoyed a high level of mutual political trust. Our two countries have each seen the other's development as an opportunity for our own, supported each other in independently managing our own affairs, and growing stronger and helped each other in an endeavor to achieve common development and common prosperity. We have set up a well-equipped high-level exchange mechanism for close communication, in-depth consultations, and frank exchange of ideas on major issues of our mutual concern to diffuse possible difficulties and problems in our cooperation and maintain our bilateral relations at a high level. We have carried out mutually beneficial economic cooperation. Our bilateral trade has increased more than tenfold over the past 15 years. Our cooperation has expanded from traditional trade only to a wide range of other fields such as investment, financing, energy, aviation and aerospace, high technology, high speed rail, and agriculture. From national to local, from simple trading business to joint research and development, joint manufacturing and others, and from border trade to cooperation in major strategic projects. As a result, our economic interests have become deeply intertwined. People to people and cultural exchanges between our two countries have thrived. We have introduced a number of theme events, including the Chinese or Russian year, the Chinese or Russian language year, the Chinese or Russian tourism year, and the youth exchange year. 
The event of media exchange year is in full swing now. All these events have helped our two peoples to increase favorable impressions of each other and further consolidated their traditional friendship. Our two countries have closely coordinated and collaborated with each other in regional and international affairs and cooperated and supported each other in international and regional organizations, including the United Nations, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Conference on Interaction and Conference Building Measures in Asia, BRICS, Russia-India-China Foreign Ministers Meeting, and the G20. We have worked together to facilitate the process of political solutions to regional and international flashpoints and to improve the global governance system. We have thus become key elements and constructive forces in promoting international peace and stability. Our experience over the past 15 years has proved that the purposes and principles stipulated in the treaty conform to the fundamental interests of our two countries and peoples and to the trend of the times for global peace and development. These purposes and principles can stand the test of changes in the world and prove to have strong vitality. They provide fundamental guarantee and an everlasting driving force for a healthy and steady development of the comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination between China and Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, today, 15 years after the signing of the treaty, our two peoples expect to see our bilateral relations develop further. President Putin and I have worked out new plans for further developing our comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination in keeping with the idea of everlasting friendship enshrined in the treaty, in response to the people's expectations and in light of the new situation. We will, taking advantage of the 15th anniversary of the treaty, continue to maintain close high-level exchanges, enhance political and strategic mutual trust, and increase mutual support so as to build a strong strategic foundation for bilateral relations. We will ensure peace and tranquility in the area along the 4,300-kilometer-long China-Russia border and turn our border into a strong bond for friendship and cooperation through border cooperation. We will build on what we have achieved in economic cooperation, enhance the complementarity of the development strategies of our two countries, and the complementarity between the Belt and Road Initiative and the Eurasian Economic Union. In doing so, we will advance our economic cooperation to a higher level, which will benefit not only the Chinese and Russian peoples, but also people on the Eurasian continent. We will enhance people-to-people -people and cultural exchanges, in particular, by giving full play to the China-Russia Friendship, Peace and Development Committee, a main channel for people-to-people -people exchanges, increase contacts between the two peoples, and promote the concept of peace underlined by the treaty. In this way, people from all sectors of the two countries will know and understand each other better and pass down long-standing friendship from generation to generation. We will uphold the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and basic norms of international relations, strengthen international strategic collaboration, and work for a fairer, and more reasonable international order and for political settlement of international and regional flashpoints, so as to safeguard world peace, security, and stability. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation between China and Russia, a major milestone in the history of China-Russia relations, has had a positive impact on the, on the world. 
we have every reason to believe that with the profound changes and complexities in the international landscape, the treaty will prove to have great demonstration effects and strong vitality. As the tides of history roll on, the call of the times cannot be ignored. Aspirations of the world's peoples cannot be suppressed, and the trend towards peace and development is irresistible. Let us join hands in fulfilling the commitments made in the treaty and forge ahead with an open mind towards a better future for China-Russian relations and a world blessed with peace, friendship, and sunshine for the coming generations. Thank you all. Build an innovative, invigorated, interconnected, and inclusive world economy. September 4, 2016. Opening speech at the G20 Hangzhou Summit. Dear colleagues, I declare the G20 Hangzhou Summit open. I am pleased to meet you all here in Hangzhou. First of all, I want to extend a warm welcome to you. Last year's G20 Antalya Summit was a great success, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Turkey, which chaired last year's summit again for its outstanding job and for achieving positive results. Turkey made strong, sustainable, and balanced growth through collective action, the theme of the summit, and promoted results in terms of inclusiveness, implementation, and investment. China has always positively commented on the various tasks carried out by Turkey during its presidency. Last November, when I introduced Hangzhou to you in Antalya, I quoted a Chinese saying which goes, Up in heaven there is paradise. Down on earth there is Suzhou and Hangzhou. I believe that the Hangzhou Summit will present you an opportunity to appreciate a unique mixture of the past and present Hangzhou. Today, this invitation has become a reality. Here we have both old and new friends as we gather in Hangzhou to discuss major development plans for the world economy. In the coming two days, we will discuss topics including enhancement of macro policy coordination, innovation in growth models, more efficient global economic and financial governance, robust international trade and investment, inclusive and interconnected development, and other prominent issues that may impact the world economy. Eight years ago, at the most critical point of the global financial crisis, the world economy was sliding towards a precipice. The G20 was entrusted to pull it back onto a track of stability in a spirit of partnership and joint action. That was an unprecedented move. Unity triumphed over differences. Mutual benefit replaced selfish gains. That crisis made people remember the G20 and led to the establishment of the G20 as the major forum for international economic cooperation. Eight years later, the world economy has again arrived at a critical moment. Scientific and technological progress, population growth, economic globalization, and other main engines that propelled world economic growth over the past several decades have shifted down a gear and their impetus for the world economy has visibly weakened. The growth impetus brought about by the previous round of scientific and technological progress has gradually slackened, and a new round of scientific and technological and industrial revolution has yet to gain momentum. A grain society and low population growth rate in major economies have brought about economic and social pressure on various countries. Economic globalization has suffered a setback. Protectionism and inward-looking tendencies have reasserted themselves. The multilateral trade system has been adversely impacted. In spite of the marked progress in financial oversight reform, 
risks have continued to accumulate, including high leverage and large bubbles. How to make financial markets effectively serve the real economy while maintaining stability still remains a major headache for many countries. Given the composite effects of these factors, although the world economy has generally maintained a recovery posture, it is still faced with multiple risks and challenges, including a lack of growth impetus, sluggish demand, recurrent volatility in financial markets, and a sustained slump in international trade and investment. Although the G20 is a forum for the world's major economies with pivotal influences and roles, it also puts itself at the forefront of risks and challenges, and of expanding growth space. The world community has high expectations of the G20 and places great hopes on the current summit. We need to square up to problems and jointly seek answers through respective actions and collective efforts. It is hoped that based on its past achievements, the G20 Hangzhou Summit will offer a prescription that can treat both the symptoms and root causes of the problems and work out comprehensive measures to get the world economy onto a path of robust, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth. First, in the face of the current challenges, we should enhance macroeconomic policy coordination, join forces to promote global economic growth, and help maintain financial stability. G20 members should adopt sounder and more balanced macroeconomic policies in light of their own country's realities, use various effective policy tools, make overall plans for working out fiscal, monetary, and structural reform policies, strive to expand global overall demand, improve the quality of supply in all respects, and solidify the foundation of economic growth. While formulating and implementing the Hangzhou Action Plan, we should continue to enhance policy coordination, reduce negative spillover effects, jointly help maintain financial stability, and raise market confidence. Second, in the face of the current challenges, we should innovate new development models and tap growth impetus. The G20 should adjust its policy thinking and place equal emphasis on short-term policies and medium and long-term policies, as well as on demand-side management and supply-side reform. This year, we have reached a consensus on the G20 blueprint on innovative growth and have unanimously decided to open up a new path and expand new frontiers for the world economy through innovation, structural reforms, new industrial revolution, and digital economy. We need to firmly continue in this direction, help lift the world economy out of the situation of lackluster recovery and fragile growth, and lay a solid foundation for a new round of growth and prosperity. Third, in the face of the current challenges, we should improve the global economic governance and solidify its mechanism guarantee. The G20 needs to steadily improve the international monetary system, optimize the governance structure of international financial institutions, and give full play to the role of SDR of the International Monetary Fund, the global financial safety net needs to be improved, and cooperation in financial oversight, international taxation, and anti-corruption needs to be enhanced so as to increase the capability of the world economy to resist risks. This year, we have reactivated the G20 International Financial Framework Working Group. We will continue to promote it and raise its effectiveness. Fourth, in the face of, of the current challenges, we need to build an open world economy and continue to push trade and investment liberalization and facilitation. Protectionism is like treating an ailment with poison. From a short-term perspective, protectionism may seem to relieve a country's internal pressure, but from a long-term perspective, it will inflict irreparable damage on the country itself and on the world economy as a whole. The G20 should not adopt beggar-thy-neighbor policies. Instead, it should advocate and promote an open world economy, avoid adopting new protectionism measures, 
strengthen coordination and cooperation in investment policies and take effective actions to promote trade growth. We should give full play to the radiating effect and locomotive roles of infrastructure, construction, and connectivity. Help developing countries and small and medium-sized companies to become part of the global value chain and push for further opening, exchanges, and integration of the global economy. Fifth, in the face of the current challenges, we should implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and promote inclusive development. Realizing common development is the hope of the people of all countries, particularly the developing countries, according to available statistics. The world's Gini coefficient is already around 0.7, a figure that is higher than the recognized danger point of 0.6. This is something we should pay close attention to. This year we have placed development in a prominent position on the G20 agenda and made a joint commitment to earnest implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and formulated action plans. At the same time, we will reduce unequal and imbalanced global development and enable people of all countries to enjoy the growth results of the world economy by means of supporting the industrialization efforts of Africa and LDCs, enhancing energy access, energy efficiency, the utilization of clean energy and recyclable energy, developing inclusive finance, and encouraging young people to start businesses. Dear colleagues, the G20 bears the expectations of various countries. It has important missions. We need to make an effort to build up the G20 and steer the world economy in a sound direction of prosperity and stability. First, advancing with the times and giving full play to its leading role, the G20 should adjust its own development direction in light of the needs of the world economy and further transform itself from a crisis management body to a long-term and effective governance mechanism. In the face of major and salient problems, the G20 has the responsibility to play a leadership role, demonstrate a strategic vision, chart a course, and identify a development path for the world economy. Second, words should be matched with action. We need to adopt pragmatic actions. It is better to enforce one thing than making thousands of commitments. We should make the G20 an action team instead of a talking shop. This year, we have formulated action plans in the spheres of sustainable development, green finance, improved energy efficiency, and anti-corruption, and we should implement every action in real earnest. Third, the G20 should create a platform for cooperation in the spirit of making joint efforts for the benefit of all involved. We should continue to enhance the mechanism building of the G20, to ensure that cooperation will be extended and expanded. It is necessary to extensively seek suggestions and listen attentively to the voices of countries all around the world, particularly those of the developing countries, so that the G20 will be even more inclusive in its work and it will respond to the appeals of the people of all countries more effectively. Fourth, the partnership spirit. The partnership spirit is the most precious, as precious asset of the G20. Although we may differ in national conditions and development stages, and we may face different challenges, we share the same desire for promoting economic growth, the same intention of addressing crises and challenges, and the same vision for realizing common development. As long as we carry forward the partnership spirit of going through thick and thin together, we will be able to ride through the rough waves of the world economy and embark on a brand new voyage for future growth. Dear colleagues, in the course of preparing for the Hangzhou Summit, China has put into practice the concept of openness, transparency, and inclusiveness 
and maintained close contact and coordination with all other G20 members. We have also held various forms of parallel dialogue. We have briefed the UN, African Union, Group of 77, LDCs, landlocked countries, and small island nations, and given information on our preparations for the Hangzhou Summit to countries all over the world and people who have interest in the G20, and listened attentively to their calls and appeals. Their opinions and suggestions have played an important part in the preparations for this summit. I expect that in the discussions in the next two days, we will pool our wisdom and efforts to make sure that the Hangzhou Summit will realize the objectives of promoting world economic growth, enhancing international economic cooperation, and pushing G20 development. Let us make the Hangzhou Summit a new starting point. Lead the convoy of the world economy on a voyage from the Chiantang River here and head into the vast ocean. Thank you all.